Hi, here's a math. Find the area of this guy. How'd you do it? You don't know any formula for... One thing you might have thought is cutting it up in different known shaped pieces and adding up their area. Congrats, that's calculus. The core idea is to get a better and better answer by cutting it smaller and smaller to fit more and more area inside known shapes. But wait, that just made it harder to solve. Look how many areas you'll have to figure out now, right? All right, time for some history lessons. This is Mr. Gravity, also responsible for these cultish symbols that you see in many places. When that apple fell, he came up with gravity, and to calculate its motion, he invented calculus. There were others guys as well, like this guy, this guy, and these two guys, but they are not popular, so they don't count. When the plague happened in mid-1660s, his university was closed for a year. That year, he worked on his own framework of math, which he called the method of fluxions. It was a lengthy discovery, so it wasn't an eureka moment. It was more like a gradually built understanding. To sum up what they did, here's a bush. Imagine the bush as where math gets broken, but you really want to know what's inside the bush. So Gravity Guy invented a way for you. He wants you to walk towards the bush as close as possible, but never touch it. And from the opposite way too. While you do that, you keep an eye on the value you're approaching. That's called finding a value that should be there but isn't. Or as the nerds call it, finding limit. By the way, did you know AI uses calculus to learn new things? Yeah, crazy, I know. In a nutshell, AI has billions of knobs that can be dialed, each knob contributing to its understanding. For now, let's look at only two. To learn something new, at first it holds a knob constant and dials the other one just a tiny bit, and if it had a positive effect, it continues. The same thing it then does for the other knob. In reality, these knobs are parameters, and the process is partial differentiation. Here's an innocent looking function, but if you put 4 as an input, it appears to be undefined. To figure it out, let's use a value that is very close to 4, but not 4. Let's try plugging that in and whoa, we get a number. Now let's do the same thing, but with closer and closer value of 4. Infinitely close? No, not infinitely close. A finite amount, but you ask the question, what value the function approaches? as that input value approaches 4. Traditionally, it is written this way. This arrow part represents what value the variable is approaching, and you solve this limit to find the value the entire function is approaching. There you go. Now you know limit. Oh no, look. A car with a drunk driver. It moves sometimes slow and sometimes fast. Sometimes it doesn't. What was the speed of the car right before it stopped, you may ask. To find out, let's look at how to find speed of an object in a moment of time. To do that, we take two pictures at a certain interval, take the total distance it has traveled, and divide with the interval itself. Then we just decrease the interval just like we did with limit. But never touching zero. Because if you do that, the result appears to be undefined. So now that the interval is extremely close to zero, we clever up and say it is the velocity at that moment in time. Great, let's look at some cult symbols now. The small interval that we did is represented as dt and the distance traveled as ds, which we divided to get velocity. Great, now we know how much velocity the car had right before it stopped. Partial derivative. This is the place most people start banging their head on the table, contemplating their life. Let's not get depressed and speed through it. That is a rocket. Rockets are cool. Rockets require fuel to gain speed. Fuel contribute to its mass. Fuel burns. Less fuel. Less mass. More speed. More distance traveled. The more time passes, the more distance is traveled. The less mass, more speed, and more distance traveled. To isolate the effects of each variable, time and mass, you partially differentiate, which just means to stop the influence of one variable and solely focus on the other variable's one-on-one -on -one relationship to the function. A cool way of saying it, rate of change of function's output due to individual variables. So many big talks, let them in. Oh hey look, 
a car with no windows, riding on a straight road. Only way to know from inside where the car is right now is by looking at the speedometer. But how? That's speed, not distance. Well, first of all, let's note the speed at different timestamps and then plot it in a graph. Here's what it looks like. Here, x dimension represents time and the y represents velocity. If you're smart, you know how to calculate distance, velocity multiplied with time. Sadly, if the velocity were to be constant, we would have done that, but it's not. However, notice how that represents the area under the graph. You know, velocity is the height, time is the width. Now we know that to find the distance traveled, we need this area, which is under the graph. Looking at our original graph, things are not looking good. None of us knows how to find that area. One thing we can do is cut it up into small pieces, even smaller, much smaller. Great, now we can just find those small stripes area and add them up to get an approximate value. But that's gonna take years. GTA 6 might be out by then. So what we do is we find the antiderivative, just like we looked for velocity by using the distance it has traveled. Now we do the opposite, using velocity to find distance. Solving this integration almost means finding the antiderivative, which finds out the area for us. So essentially, antiderivative is the function of the area under curve with the same input. Now there are some formulas and stuff to figure out the antiderivative. Here is the most basic one, but we are not going to dive into those. So at last, you take the start and end point which you are interested in to finally know how far the car has traveled. You want to see something scary? Yeah, that was scary, but don't worry. If you're not majoring in a physics or math related field, then chances are you'll never need those. For now, let's just know what these mean. This thing here is called a double integral. The other guy is called a closed integral. Remember how we found the area under a graph using integration? This guy does the same thing but twice and find out the volume of a three dimensional function. And the term closed means the thing you're integrating is a loop, which means it has no starting point nor end point. Whoa, whoa, what on earth was that? Get it away from here, get out. Now sometimes working with a one term expression is hard. By that I mean like sine x, cos x, ln x, and so on. I mean these are just one definition and it's easy to get stuck in math problems where you cannot progress any further. So Gravity Guy made a solution for you. By replacing those with a bunch of terms, you are not stuck anymore. What these represents is an approximation, an approximation of the function you want to replace. The more terms you use, the more accurate the approximation. You stayed till the end? Thank you for staying.